c'était un plan audacieux. It had no name because it was also such a top secret operation. They risked their lives with others to help people to escape. They could be allied soldiers or airmen who were shot down, for example, over Belgium or northern France and Holland and who were looking to escape over the Pyrenees. Il fallait que la France, l'Angleterre, enfin tous nos amis soient hors des joues de l'Allemagne. Il fallait se défendre, on a dû se battre. Many died and many were tortured and many went to the camps. Il faut qu'on se souvienne de tout ce que ces hommes ont fait. Charlie de Hepsé, Charles Kepens, William Hugeux, Pelfort. Quand j'étais petit, je trouvais que l'histoire n'avait aucune importance, que c'était des choses nouvelles seulement qui ont d'importance. Mais aujourd'hui, je ne vois pas comme ça. Je trouve que c'est important de voir les gens qui ont mis de l'énergie, qui, qui ont mis euh, leur personnalité pour des choses qui valent la peine. Steve is still there, and these people are still there. It had something of a miracle, something of the Basque tenacity. And every time I come here, I feel the same gratitude, and I feel uh, I never go enough to see uh, uh, Manesha's graveyard. And I never say thank you enough to everybody. Merci, Manesh. On fait un coup de l'évangile. He began speaking only when the Belgian television made a movie and we came down to Mandive to film with the Belgian television. And uh, that was the first time I heard him talk about, you know, this whole time. Mon père ne parlait pas beaucoup. Lui ne parlait pas de toutes ces médailles, mais... C'est quelqu'un qui, voilà, qui était tellement hors du cadre que c'était évident, ça, ça, ça coulait de source qu'il avait fait des choses extraordinaires. Alors c'est une histoire que moi j'ai entendue au Brésil, de mon père. De, de, euh, mon père ensuite, après la guerre, est allé en Amérique du Sud. Et il nous a raconté, c'était une histoire à lui. This is the middle of the war. The story begins when France was divided in two, in the uh, zone occupée and non-occupée. And that lasted until uh, November 1942. At this point in the war, the escape lines were getting, the resistance was getting more organized. Escape lines were uh, networks or groups of people or individuals who sheltered those who were seeking to escape from uh, Nazi-occupied Europe. So they could be allied soldiers or airmen who were shot down, for example, over Belgium, or northern France and Holland, and who were looking to escape over the Pyrenees. They could be individuals who were looking to escape, who wanted to avoid, for example, the STO, as it was called, a mandatory work program, which would have seen them return to Germany, which they didn't, of course, want to do. Or they could be Jewish families, or people who simply wanted to get back to the United Kingdom, for example, to join the Free French or Free Belgians and to get back into the war against Nazi Germany. There was also a problem of, because there were more people participating, there were more people being arrested, and the need to help people get out of the occupied part of Europe, either to Spain or to England. So, the escape lines uh, sheltered and helped those people in many ways. Um, they, as I said, they sheltered them, they provided them with false documents, uh, and finally they, 
courier them or uh, accompany them over, uh, over the Pyrenees. Service Zero was one of the first escape lines to be set up in the summer of 1940 in um, Brussels. And it started out small, it started out as a, an intelligence gathering effort and doing some relay of documents. And pretty quickly it became much more complex, had various other purposes, doing sabotage, relaying um, people who needed to escape. So the Service Zero started small and quickly grew and became more organized and had these little, had various cells that were connected to it. The story really is from 1942 to 1944. The key people who conceived this were Samo Verny, Dr. Scapens, Charlie de Epsi, and William Eugeux. Anselm Verny, called Selmo, was a pilot in the Belgian Air Force. Surnom était Selmo. Verny ou. Ou qui pendant ce, cette période de sa vie s'appelait Villeneuve ou Vernon, qui étaient les, les noms qu'il utilisait. Mon grand-père était quelqu'un qui avait une personnalité hors du commun. Il sortait du cadre. Très très grand, très très fort. Euh, quelqu'un qui avait un sens de l'humour incroyable, qui riait tout le temps, euh, qui faisait tout le temps des blagues qui euh, était extrêmement, euh, je pense, intelligent. L'aviation militaire en Belgique, en 1940, les avions militaires belges ont été abattus par la chasse allemande, euh, qui était équipée de Michel Schmidt et Stuka. Et nous avions des avions à l'époque de 14-18, donc des biplans. Heureusement, mon père est arrivé en retard sur le champ d'aviation. Et ils ont été tous abattus. Et donc Dardy a été sauvé par le fait qu'il soit arrivé en retard. Et donc comme pilote, il n'y avait plus d'aviation belge. Et donc il est rentré dans la résistance. La Belgique s'est fait envahir très vite. Et donc ils ont déserté, ils ont quitté l'armée pour venir et rentrer dans la résistance. Avec l'intention d'aller en Angleterre rejoindre la RAF la Royal Air Force pour reprendre leur métier d'aviateur et continuer la guerre. He quickly got involved in doing resistance work. Early on there were a lot of military people who were doing kind of whatever they could to to start to get the resistance going. Before he got involved in this, he had been escorting Belgian officers and Belgian officials out of Belgium and ultimately to Spain. So he had quite a bit of experience. By the time he participated in this operation, he probably had already um, passed 50 people from Belgium uh, down to, to Spain. The second head of Service Zero was a man named William Uge. He was assigned to coordinate the activity of the Belgian resistance on the continent. So he and Selmo Verny and another pilot named Charlie de Epsi, who had also been in the war and who had been doing resistance work in Belgium, they became the pair of couriers for a line, it was called the Poste du Commandement Belge, in Grenoble, and this was this idea that this it was going to be this top secret line. Charles Stapens was a young Belgian ophthalmologist. He had been in the uh, Belgian military. He was a medical officer attached to the same unit that's of Selmo Verny. That's how they knew each other. And he had lived through the First World War and his parents had been involved in the resistance in World War I. So he had this deep memory of, of, of the war. He wanted to do something, but he also wanted to wait and figure out how he could pull this off. But he also knew that it was very, very dangerous. And so he only, only wanted to work with somebody he trusted. And, and so um, when Selmo Verny, who had been doing this early work, recruited him, he accepted. His medical office was being used as kind of a mailbox for relay of documents. And he was almost arrested there and so had to escape. 
but he wanted to continue his work in, um, in the resistance. Verny, Selmo Verny, and Dr. Scavens, who became Monsieur Perrault, and still is Monsieur Perrault, to people who live in the area, were assigned to go to the Pyrenees to look for a new point of passage. And they had a map, a Michelin map with a red line on it, which looked interesting, not knowing what it was. Because of the geography, Mendive had been a place where people um, from the beginning of the war had landed in Mendive and it was one of the shorter routes from France into Spain. And so the people in Mendive had seen many early fugitives who were not being relayed by the Belgian resistance or working for the factory temporarily, but who just happened to land in Mendive and who found their own passage out of the country. So Mendive was, was an active place um, throughout the war. And so they land in Mendive and discover that in fact what this was was a representation of the cable, a sawmill and logging operation that had been established in the 20s. So here was this massive industrial operation that had fallen into semi-ruin, but realizing that this was just a facility that could be used as a facade, as an underground railroad to get not only people, but documents out of France. They make their trip to Mendive, discover the abandoned sawmill, and he thinks, um, I'm gonna propose to Cyril that he buy the sawmill because it's a natural thing, because he's a broker. It can supply wood for the, the factories. And he knew well that Cyril Pomerantsev was an extraordinarily generous man with a very big vision. And so he, after they made this trip, he went to Paris and convinced Cyril to buy the sawmill. Comme mon père avait gagné de l'argent, Charles lui a demandé si éventuellement il rentrerait pas dans un projet de résistance ici en France. Mon père était un homme idéaliste, très courageux et très généreux. Et je pense que le fait qu'il a euh, vu le massacre qu'a été la révolution communiste en Russie, où il a assisté à des, à des fusillements au coin de la rue où il vivait, sans aucune raison, de, de dizaines de personnes. Je pense que cette invasion de, de, des, des nazis aussi a fait que tout de suite il a été d'accord de, de rentrer dans ce projet et c'est lui qui a acheté la propriété de Mendive, de la série de Mendive. Et ensuite, il est parvenu à apporter des câbles de Belgique et ils ont commencé ensemble, Charles et lui, à faire la, la, la à réorganiser la Syrie. So that's really the beginning of this story, is that their mission was to open an escape line, but particularly for Belgians, or for the major Belgian resistance network they were working for, which was Service Zero. But because of how the war evolved, it changed. There was an evolution of the concept from the time that they first discovered the sawmill, the ruin, to um, the time it actually started to function fully. The operation of the Mendive sawmill would be essentially a bank for the resistance, as well as a place to pass documents and people. And so by the time this cell got connected, it was the summer, fall of 1942. But unlike a lot of the other resistance the small cells or it had no name. It never really gained a name because it was also such a top secret operation. So when Monsieur Perrault arrives to set up both the normal and the clandestine part of his operation, first he has to get everything arranged and then he starts to think about the web of people who were essential to accomplish the secret part of his operation. L'unique italien qui carrasse juste et qui est spécialiste de câble. J'ai tiré ta maille qui le montre la scène. Je suis un câble d'italien avec scène hanno usato anche italiani, cable che non hanno marciato su questo cable, hanno mai rubato, non 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 hanno 
pegué o cable a un día en carga tú te lucía en una seguiría. So there were all these young men looking for work. Me dijo que seguiría de Morán va a ser serna y gente. No tiene ahí te llena si en Francia ver ti que está va a ser gente pobre y no me te llena lan lan que está. So the idea for these young draft dodgers was to be employed, be put up in the mountain zone to work on the crew, and then earn a little bit of money, which would enable them to organize their plan for flight. It wasn't just the logging operation. There were shepherds who knew the terrain, and many of the shepherds knew the, uh, the smuggling routes, um, and so they knew the terrain well, and so they were paid to take people across. He wanted somebody who was pretty invisible. And so, knowing little about his story, he approached Jean-Serge Charles to be the guide on occasion for people who would be coming to Mendive to get to, to Spain. So Jean-Serge Charles, who was called Manesh by the people in Mendive, was a shepherd who had um, served as a soldier, a French soldier in the First World War. He was truly a great hero of both World War I and World War II. He had been captured, he escaped, and he came back to Mendive. <laughs> He was known kind of as the local buffoon. He loved to tell stories, and nobody really believed all the things that he had done in World War I, but he came back with some medals, and he also had a pension. And so he became the ideal candidate for being the guide to get people out. As quickly as Pomerantsev made the decision to buy the sawmill, Jean-Serge Charles said he would help uh, Monsieur Perrault, no questions asked. The other important thing that was central to the history of or to the operation of the sawmill as a point of passage was that in November 1942, all of France becomes occupied. Soon after that, the Germans began conscripting a huge population of French people. Anyone aged 18 to 50 could be drafted to go to work in the German war factories. It was November 1942, which was right after the, the occupation. So the idea was to get employed by the factory and get up to the mountain zone as the first part of your escape out of France. That was for the young draft dodgers. For the VIP, who were being escorted to the area. Their path was really, they arrived in Oloron saint marie and the idea was not to come to Mendive, but to meet Serrachar, the passeur, up in the mountains, oftentimes near Behorlegi, and to go around, and the, the destination was what is now the Casa Irati, was the Casa del Rey. You know, all the fugitives came here and then were passed out and given different routes and different passeurs because this was only one leg. That was how the two sorts of um, escapes happened. Oloron Saint-Marie was a key point 
in the relay of people and documents. It was kind of a depot. When Dr. Scapins set up this whole secret operation, he wanted to make sure that everything looked as, you know, didn't look suspicious. And so he didn't want the couriers who were bringing the kinds of this material to come to Mendive. He wanted them to drop the material in Oloron. And then there were company vehicles that would come on a weekly basis to pick up or get repaired. And so there was just this flow of, of things so that it would look normal. And there was a courier who came with material. He was told to deliver it to Oloron and instead he decided to go all the way to Mendive. And Dr. Scapins, Monsieur Perrault, was furious because he thought he'd so carefully covered, camouflaged everything. And he told this, this guy who arrived by bicycle that he couldn't go back the way he had come. He would get arrested. And this guy was so sure that he'd, but he'd gotten this far that he could go back. And he was arrested and so tortured and talked. Finalement, la Gestapo a découvert, euh, sont venus pour possiblement les fusiller, mais les deux ont, ont sont parvenus à tromper la, la, la Gestapo d'une façon spectaculaire. Pour les disent mira boulot qu'on montre, ils ouvrent la ouison. There were four Gestapo. Um, there was actually one from the area and three from Paris. Pour les policiers secrets, police secrète. Quand on dit bonjour monsieur, est-ce que monsieur Perro est là? Everybody said, yes, his office is up there, we'll take you. And so they walked into Charles's office. Charles, when the Gestapo was arrived, he said, we're going to call the local people to the local and they'll confirm that we're going to be wrong. He made it seem that the phone didn't work because, in fact, he certain transported certain things for the Germans and he gave dinners also to the Germans so that the German locals, so that they believe que en fait ils étaient leurs amis mais en fait ils faisaient semblant de téléphoner le téléphone marchait très bien et ils disaient le téléphone ne marche pas mais c'était uniquement pour gagner du temps he said you know he he said this is all false and said uh, i've got these papers you know we've been and so they said the the gestapo said we believe you but we have to take you to paris my father said oh no problem i'll come with you to paris for a longer interrogation um, just let me give instructions to the workmen. Give me a few minutes, I'll go out, and, and then I'll go with you. He was going to the room. He said, I'm going to go to the room. He said, I'm going to go to the room. He said, I'm going to go to the room. He said, I'm going to go to the room. He said, I'm going to go to the room. He said, I'm going to go to the room. He said, I'm going to go to the room. He said, I'm going to go to the room. He said, I'm going to go to the room. He said, I'm going to go to the room. He said, I'm going to go to the room. Mendia nego iten zena, zaro xar, haren gana joan zen, arrantzakon jari ba, behar da karri pe bat, ni gordatzeko. He spent two plus days hiding out in a, a place in the rocks. There was a big split. Meanwhile, Cyril Pomerantsev is sitting in the office, as was Pelfort, who was the chief engineer of the operation. And Pomerantsev realized he had to buy time. Mais c'est tout de suite rendu compte de la situation et il a dit, au lieu, de, au lieu de nier, il a dit oui, je me doutais de ça. He said, you know, I think I've been duped. Here I trusted him, you know, um, with this big operation, you know, I'll go find him. Let me, let me go find him, I'll help you. So he played the turncoat. Les Allemands ont été euh, séduits par l'idée. Et, et ils se sont allés, euh, ils ont tous euh, ensemble euh, dans la nuit, ils ont commencé à escalader jusqu'à un refuge qui devait être un de ces refuges ici. Et à dernière minute, il est parvenu à, à les s'aimer. Et Cyril Char était sort of standing guard parce qu'il y avait des trucs allemands qui passaient. Dr. Scapins became the most hunted, wanted man in the valley. Um, and there was Cyril Char protecting him. En bici, Sansen. Ensuite, le jour suivant, ils se sont retrouvés dans la montagne parce qu'ils connaissaient les lieux tous les deux. And then the head Spanish lumberjack, a man named Campins, took them to the Castle del Rey. And so then together they, they fled. Ils avaient des énormes doutes où ils allaient atterrir parce que 
Il descendait de la montagne, il regardait les maisons et il se disait est-ce que c'est un ami ou est-ce que c'est un ennemi Parce que là, en Espagne, il y avait les deux, les deux côtés. You know, here was Franco. That was... Et, et finalement, ils étaient épuisés. Et ils ont dit bon, maintenant, c'est à Dieu va, on, on, cette maison-ci. Et c'était une maison qui les a protégés, elle les a déguisés. After Dr. Scapin's superhero escaped, Pelfort continued the, the secret work of the factory for a second year, but the connection to the Belgian resistance ended. And he allied with the French resistance because he'd been a French military officer. So it continued to be a point of passage for the STO draft dodgers. And he actually was caught a year later, and he and um, four other company workers were eventually deported to Germany and died in a, in a concentration camp. The big question is, why hasn't it been better known? This was a short chapter of these men's lives. It was kind of an unexpected detour. All of them were enormously ambitious. They had, you know, they had fulfilled their more than patriotic duty and wanted to get on with their lives. And also the other thing I think that made it the story less visible was that the factory got taken down. The sawmill ended in 1956. It continued to operate after the war, but it was gone. So the traces of the story were not visible. Then, you know, all those things disappear and the, and the story kind of um, became dormant. Tout d'abord, je veux souhaiter à tous la bienvenue à Mendiv, où nous nous sommes réunis pour nous souvenir et célébrer la mémoire de ces courageuses personnes qui ont participé à la ligne d'évasion d'ici à Navarre. Nous célébrons également la mémoire des habitants de Mendiv et de la région environnante qui ont collaboré à la ligne d'évasion de quelque façon que ce soit. Basque Pyrenees Freedom Trails Association is a charitable organization uh, based in the Basque Country, uh, which is dedicated to recovering the historical memory of what were called the escape lines during World War II throughout the Basque Country. Well, our objectives are to recover that memory of the, uh, the bravery shown by Basque people at that time. And the most interesting part for us is retracing the routes and walking those routes uh, and, and getting people interested in walking in the footsteps of their forefathers. It was very moving for me to drive into Madrid and to see the people I knew. Mon père a beaucoup parlé d'Irati, mais il a jamais Il, il, il n'a jamais parlé que c'était aussi beau que ça. Moi, j'ai déjà beaucoup voyagé, mais j'ai rarement vu quelque chose qui est aussi beau. C'est magnifique. C'est un endroit de, de Dieu, ici. Pour moi, et je pense pour mes oncles, ma mère, mes oncles et tantes qui étaient là avec, avec moi aujourd'hui, avec nous, je pense que c'était euh, marcher sur leurs traces, euh, passer là où ils sont passés, voir la difficulté que ça a dû être en se disant que nous on le fait dans des conditions de soleil, de beau temps, d'amitié et qu'eux ils le faisaient dans des conditions de nuit, de mauvais temps, de faim, d'angoisse de, et de peur et de danger et pour nous c'était euh, essayer de, de se remettre dans leurs traces et peut-être de recréer un lien avec, euh, avec eux de cette manière là et de leur dire merci. We always find that you know, these stories um, have fallen uh, into mystery, I guess, over the years. And there are a number of reasons for that. People who worked on the escape lines were, by, by their very nature, they didn't shout it out. Um, and when the war was over, um, they moved on, but also moved on because they, they wanted to put the war behind them. Anselm Verny became an executive at Sabina Airline. William Jeu, uh 
had various posts. Um, he, in the immediate aftermath of the war, he became the Minister of Information in Brussels. He then became a university professor. He wrote books about the resistance. Uh, Dr. Scapins emigrated um, with his family to Boston and became a world-famous uh, retinal surgeon. Uh, Serge Chav continued to be the storyteller of the village, um, heavily decorated. Um, uh, unfortunately, Charlie de Hepsi did not survive the war. He was actually one of 15 résistants who was executed in a village north of Toulouse um, right after the débarquement. Et donc je trouve que ce, cette période de vie d'hommes qui ont eu le courage de résister à l'Allemagne et qui ont pris et qui ont fait ça au sacrifice de leur vie pour sauver d'autres vies, je trouve que on doit leur rendre hommage. On doit nous s'en souvenir, on doit apprendre à nos enfants. Euh, mon père ensuite, après la guerre, est allé en Amérique du Sud et il nous a raconté, c'était une histoire à lui. Ce qu'il a vécu ici, je pense que c'est quelque chose qui marque n'importe quelle personne. Il savait qu'il risquait sa vie tous les jours. We owe them a great debt and I think uh, it's important to keep the memory of that escape line and escape lines generally Donc il faut qu'on continue à, à se battre pour euh, que toutes les générations soient au courant de ce que nos parents ont vécu et euh, ont traversé. He was one of many, one of many, many, many brave people who uh, risked his life to assure freedom for Europe. I think anyone who, who recovers and, and rediscovers um, the stories of the escape lines are, are immediately drawn into them uh, by how interesting and how courageous people were. So, so I think it's, um, it's exciting to, to put that out there and, and to watch people uh, enjoy seeing, seeing the information and the stories again.